It was perfect. The Bernini columns framed the main altar of St. Peter's Basilica like the picture that was worth a million words. The Baldacchini, the first masterpiece created for the Vatican by the 26-year-old genius Gian Lorenzo Bernini, was what all 62 of us transitional deacons from around the world were focused on, staged and ready to process down the nave of the most famous church in the world, St. Peter's Basilica. It was Trinity Sunday, the day that traditionally the Pope ordains men to the priesthood from all over the world. I was one of them. Arguably, it was the finest moment of my life. It was like a dream. Behind me, only a few feet away, was Mother Teresa of Calcutta, flanked by two of her missionaries of charity. In front of me, the successor of St. Peter, Pope John Paul the Great. Each one of us was led up and knelt before the Holy Father to receive the sacrament of holy orders. When my turn came, I was led up to the Pope. I knelt before him, and his hands came down on my head, poised to confer the sacrament of holy orders, one of three sacraments which imparts an indelible mark upon the recipient. And that means that it can never be taken away. That means for all eternity, that sacrament stays with the individual upon whom it was conferred. Baptism and confirmation, likewise, impart an indelible mark on the soul. At that defining moment of my life, in a very strange kind of a flashback, I, I, I think you could say, I, I remembered. I remembered where I had been. I remembered where I came from. And I remembered that it was the unfathomable mercy of God that had brought me to this moment. But then, in an instant, a thousand memories crashed the gates of my mind like so many malevolent soldiers trying to break down the walls of a fortress. I remembered being in a very dark place, many dark places being addicted to cocaine. I remember the last time it almost killed me. It started at a, a Halloween party. And uh, three days later, it ended in a uh, VA psychiatric hospital. I left the party with the mistress of ceremonies, the witch went to her upscale townhouse in Beverly Hills and there began the ritual which was freebasing cocaine. Back in the late 70s and early 80s, it was an epidemic, uh, killed a lot of people, extremely seductive, extremely dangerous. The things I went through for years, you can't make it up. Uh, one, uh, at one time, one of my girlfriends was a drug dealer. Well, they did rob her, beat her up, took her money and her drugs. We found out who it was, and I hid in the closet with an Uzi machine gun ready to rock and roll. I would have killed them all, killed, killed them all. You have no idea how much agony I went through, and all I can do is keep praying that somehow God in his mercy will release them from that bondage. It's slavery. Addiction is slavery. I was homeless in the streets of Los Angeles with the clothes on my back and not a penny in my pocket. I had no hope. I could not see out of the darkness. I went and wondered, when will this end? The pain was so much, for addiction is insanity. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Jesus came to set the captives free. We made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we know him. And if he frees you, if he frees you, you will be free indeed.
But I had survived it. I had survived that and a thousand other cold, dark, miserable nights. Nights in places that still, to this day, give me nightmares. But that day in 1991, May 26, Trinity Sunday, it was all worth it that day. Oh, there had been a lot more than the pain and suffering of destitution, drug addiction, and homelessness that had brought me to that fine moment. There had been many hours and many years of preparation in seminaries, Catholic universities, and I was then and I still am very thankful for everything that was given to me. There's a lot of water that's gone under the bridge since that day in 1991. A lot of miles traveled, over a million. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people listened to me by the grace of God. And I don't take any of it for granted. I don't take it for granted that I was allowed to live through those dark days. I don't take it for granted that I was allowed to be ordained and ordained by the Pope. And I don't take it for granted that I was allowed to speak to so many people for so many years. And I don't even take it for granted that in the end I was allowed to suffer something I never thought in a million years I would have to suffer. You never know. You never know. You may think you know how the rest of your life is going to go, but you never know until it unfolds, day by day and minute by minute. The ups and the downs, the dark, the light, the good, the bad, it's all part of what makes up a human life. Mine's no different, maybe a little more intense, more radical, more ups, more downs, more good, more bad, more ugly. But in the end, we have to be thankful, because in the end, sometimes the very darkest moments can simply be the predecessor of the brightest moments we have yet. reminisce about one of the uh, more interesting periods in my life, uh, the Las Vegas years. I lived in Las Vegas for a few years. Joe and I moved to Las Vegas from New York right out of college. We graduated from Pace University and uh, we moved out to Las Vegas. I, I remember, Joe, the first time I ever saw uh, that spectacle in the desert. I had uh, driven across country and uh, it was just about dusk and I came up over the hill, and there it was, uh, uh, unbelievable spectacle. Uh, I drove down uh, and entered town on Tropicana. I stopped at the intersection of Tropicana and Las Vegas Boulevard, and some tumbleweeds blew across the strip. And uh, that, that's kind of the old Las Vegas physically, isn't it? There's, it's a big difference. Uh, a huge difference. There's no question about it. It was uh, wild times. and. and, and and similar to that, do you recall that uh, it wasn't more than a year or two after there was a major flood that came through Las Vegas, 
And Las Vegas being desert, it tends to soak so much and then it just runs. And the flood went right through literally Caesar's Palace, the old Caesar's Palace. The people were uh, knee deep in water and still shooting dice. <laughs> Nobody moved. <laughs> yeah, that happened uh, frequently um, before they uh, uh, did some engineering things to prevent that. But I remember uh, I, I literally saw cars floating away out of Caesar's Palace parking lot. And uh, they, they would have flash floods, of course. The, mount, the water would collect in the, mount, in the mountains and it would just rush down. And it, Caesar's Palace was uh, right in the line of fire. And that was a, a somewhat common spectacle uh, for a while and, until they uh, adjusted that. But th there's certainly a, a huge difference uh, between the old Las Vegas and the new. Joe and I were lucky. And then in 1973, when we moved there, that was pretty much at the juncture where the old Las Vegas was still there and the new Las Vegas uh, was just coming in. Uh, by the old, I mean uh, the, uh, the mob influence in Las Vegas. It definitely was there, but the corporate world uh, was coming in. Uh, the federal government at a certain point in time had told the state of Nevada, either you police it or we will, and they were very serious about keeping um, organized crime uh, out of the state of Nevada. And uh, so there's a big difference between the old Las Vegas and, and today's Las Vegas, right, Joe? Uh, no question about it. Uh, when we moved, uh, went to Las Vegas in 1973, a, a good-sized casino would be maybe four or 500 rooms. It would have uh, 300 slot machines, maybe 20, 21 games, two dice games, and possibly a roulette wheel. Now, uh, the casinos have three or 4,000 slot machines. It's just massive. So it's gone from, uh, in, way, in some ways, from being a, uh, I don't want to you know if I want to use the word boutique but a, a small, intimate atmosphere into a, a supermarket atmosphere. Yeah. And it's changed the character of Las Vegas, no question about that. Yeah, I remember uh, a documentary that was on uh, uh, one of the uh, cable channels, and it, it was quite well done. They had some of the old entertainers that used to play it in Las Vegas regularly. I remember Don Rickles was one of them, and they interviewed them, and uh, every single one of them uh, uh, basically said uh, the, the old Las Vegas, uh, they knew how to take care of the players, they knew how to take care of the entertainers, uh, it was friendlier, more intimate, uh, as the corporate world uh, uh, came in and more or less took over, there was a little bit of a sterilization, you might say. It became a, a little more sterile, uh, not a little more, a lot more sterile atmosphere. But um, in the good old days when Joe and I arrived, uh, it, was, it was quite a spectacle. It was, uh, the, for kids, young men in their 20s, it was a very heady experience. Uh, to say the least. I remember, Joe, some of the people we used to see. Uh, Joe Lewis was still a host at Caesar's Palace in those days. Joe right? Lewis was a, hot, a host. I'm sorry. Uh, there were so many celebrities that came through that it was it's just hard to, to know where to begin yeah. and, and, and where to end. I became quite friendly with Joe DiMaggio, and we used to have uh, dinner all the time. And this is going back into the 70s and uh, maybe the early 80s. So it was not at all uncommon to see uh, celebrities at the dice tables, at the 21 tables. It was, uh, it was an atmosphere that was unique to itself. It was. The, that, th those were the days when Frank Sinatra was still a headliner in Las Vegas. When Elvis Presley played at the Las Vegas Hilton, uh, the uh, Sammy Davis Jr., um, tremendous uh, old school, if you will, entertainers. And you would see them on a regular basis. I remember uh, when I started uh, working for the Tropicana. The Tropicana Hotel and Casino was uh, one of the many hotel casino clients that the CPA firm we worked for uh, uh, had. Uh, it, it was an interesting thing. When we went there, uh, Joe and I were the only two non-Mormons, uh, I believe, that worked for, for that office. I don't remember anyone else at that time when we started that wasn't a BYU graduate. Uh, and, and I, can you think of any? I, I, I don't recall any. There may have been one somebody who graduated from the University of Utah, but I think yeah, I, BYU I can't recall a single one. We, but, but we were kind of, a, as I remember, we were kind of a um, 
a unique uh, find, an asset, if you will, uh, for the accounting firm that, that was involved with assets and liabilities. They specialized in hotel and casino audits. Uh, I, I remember at a certain time one of the partners told, told me, well, we don't really like to send our boys uh, into that sordid atmosphere, but now two Italians from New York, jackpot. And Joe and I got to do the very best, the biggest of the hotel casino audits. My first job, uh, Joe was already there. He had gone a few months before me, and it was a big audit. The Las Vegas Hilton audit was going on. And that was my, my first week. I remember my first Friday, the end of that first work week, there was a flurry of activity uh, in the area that, that we were working. And apparently, uh, two gamblers from Mexico uh, had started, they, they did well, uh, too well, uh, in the Baccarat pit. I think they were up four million in a very short period of time. There was a flurry of activity and all of the, uh, the casino uh, manager, um, the general manager, everybody ended up in the eye in the sky. And they were peering down, frantically trying to find out if there was anything uh, going on that shouldn't have been going on. Uh, as it turned out, uh, out that it was just uh, normal uh, good luck for the two uh, Mexican gamblers. By Monday, uh, they were down seven million. That meaning the house got the four million back and the seven, and they got another seven million. Uh, and over an extended period of time, that's the way it goes. That uh, glittering spectacle in the desert wasn't built on, on the players' uh, uh, winnings. It was built on the players <laughs> losing. And, and those statistics are, are, are absolutely um, uh, solid, right, Joe? You can't get around that. No, Las Vegas. Well, let, me, let me say two things first, that, you know, in conjunction with what you were, you were talking about, about uh, the players who won great, a great deal of money. Las Vegas today, to a certain degree, but less so because of the size of it, employed hosts. And it was the job of a host to become friendly with the big players and in effect give them anything that they wanted. Uh, free, free room, food, beverage, that sort of thing, uh, in order to keep them playing at, at the tables. So uh, uh, that was one of the, the perks of being in Las Vegas if you had money. Somebody would take care of you, give you pretty much what you wanted. I don't want to go into too much detail over that, but it was whatever you would want. Um, the ninety, the, the Las Vegas is a gambling is a what I call a five percent uh, business. The house statistically will keep five percent of whatever has been bet, which means is if you bet a dollar um, on a dice game, it's theoretically worth ninety five cents. Now you, the money may change back and forth, but eventually you'll be whittled down. The longer you play, you'll uh, there's no question you're going to lose some money. Yeah, you, at a given point in time, you might win, but over an extended period of time, the statistics uh, are inexorable. Uh, and the house is going to win, and they're going to win uh, big. And it doesn't have to be a big percentage. It just go, It's over a period of time. Uh, these fantastic uh, hotels and casinos were built on the very profitable, the in, intrinsically profitable nature of the gambling business, but you know, in the old days, um, some of the characters that we ran into, uh, you know, you can't make it up. If you were going to write a novel, you could not possibly come up with more colorful characters than some of the people that we encountered at, the, at that juncture in history in Las Vegas. You know, names like uh, Benny Binion, uh, Odie Lop, Bud Soper, Don Laughlin. Uh, some of these people uh, are, are legendary. They cer they're certainly legendary in the gambling industry. Uh, I knew some of them. J Joe knew most of them. Uh, and, and it was when I think back on it, you know, decades later, movies have been made about what took place uh, at that time in history when uh, Joe and I were privileged to be able to to be part of that. Um, uh, some of the, who were some of the people you knew, Joe? You, you knew a lot of those people. Well, uh, certainly I did. I was friendly with uh, people who mostly the audience wouldn't recognize. Gene Clark was the uh, second-in-command police, uh, right of the police chief. Uh, 
Tony Torcasio was a, a well-known manager. Uh, Joe Augusto gained fame, I think, in the black book of unwanted people, as did Tony Spilatro. <laughs> uh, so yes, there was fascinating people there. There were people who had uh, definitely hadn't probably graduated from Harvard. They'd come up through the ranks, and they knew one thing: they knew it gambling. They knew it very well. Yeah, and an interesting. Uh, uh, side note uh, in the history of Las Vegas and the history of gambling in the United States actually though is the uh, connection to Steubenville, Ohio of all places. Uh, a, a, a large number of the uh, the men who uh, were basically behind gambling in Las Vegas came from Steubenville. Of course uh, Dean Martin uh, was from Steubenville but uh, a lot of these people that Joe mentioned and many more grew up in Steubenville. Now, Steubenville, Ohio, of course, uh, had a pretty pretty strong mob uh, influence there. Even my hometown, Hudson, New York, indirectly had some of it through the numbers racket. Uh, it, it was very, very common in those days. They had, uh, they had uh, underground gambling, right, Joe and Steubenville? Oh, they did. I mean, the, the, the general manager of Caesar's Palace, and I think the Frontier, and uh, also, the Tropicana those days were all, all three from Steubenville. And, yeah, uh, yeah, and they went to Cuba, didn't they? they, they didn't they go to Cuba yes, they first? Did. Uh, yes, they, they, did. they went from the underground gambling of Steubenville, Ohio. Eventually, they ended up in Havana. And, and that, some people would say, uh, was uh, unparalleled in the history of, of gambling and entertainment. At least, they, they, they are those old gamblers, if, if you mentioned Havana, in the old days of gambling in Cuba, they got all misty-eyed. They did. <laughs> Sometimes tears rolled down their face. <laughs> right. It, it was, it was quite country, a thing. Beautiful country, beautiful women, gambling. I mean, that, from, that was the heyday of gambling, and that was, right. that was the predecessor of Las Vegas gambling. They, they, didn't they go from Havana into Las Vegas? I, I, a lot of them did, that's correct. So yep. it... Uh, uh, it was important for Las Vegas to, to have people who, who were uh, skilled in the gaming business, the casino business, and the, the skills in, are, are, are substantial. They're not insubstantial. There's internal controls that have to be considered so people aren't stealing from you. Uh, there's just so many things when you talk about gambling that are, are technical issues. That it's yeah. very, very technical in a lot of sure. ways. Sure. By the time Joe and I arrived in Las Vegas, um, it, it, it was highly unlikely that you would encounter what uh, we would call a mechanic in the language of, of gambling. A mechanic is a dealer uh, who knows how to steal, basically. A, a dealer who can uh, stack the deck or uh, uh, do, play games with the dice. Uh, there weren't many mechanics, and you know, it, it, it wasn't necessary. Uh, gambling has its built-in statistics. You don't need to cheat. If you're a casino, you're out of your mind to, to risk your gambling license uh, by having mechanics at work. There were mechanics, but the, the, by the time we were there, the uh, casinos were very assiduous at trying to catch them and weed them out. As a matter of fact, there were individuals who at one time, I suppose on a high level, you could call them mechanics, but they kind of switched and became experts uh, for the for the casinos, Joe was good friends. Even uh, helped uh, uh, with a book. One of the the greatest uh, of of those figures with uh, gentleman Jack Newton, <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, Jack uh, would catch he would catch the cheaters. Right, the hotels and casinos would hire Jack. Jack Newton is a fascinating individual. He's 90 years old. He was born in 1922, 1921. He. Uh, Probably and arguably was the greatest professional cheat ever, or certainly one of the five top cheats. And he would be hired by the casinos to go in to watch games, to see if somebody was doing something. Uh, he uh, was just a fascinating man. He spent time down in Cuba and Greece, and he owned casinos in London. But that's one of the, uh, the original cast of characters. And as I said, you just can't make it up. The stories go on and on and on. Uh, the point is, the old Las Vegas was very colorful. Um, you know, after 35 or more years of boom, Las Vegas was the fastest growing city in the United States for many years. Uh, Joe was fortunate he was there for, for just about all of that. And uh, uh, looking back on it, and we look at it now, 
And uh, there, there's just a big difference. You know, 35 or more years of boom, and now mm, maybe bust. I don't know, but uh, it's, it's, it's just not uh, like it used to be. It, th th that's exactly right. I mean, just, just go back to the 1960s and early 70s. It was a place to go for people to gamble, have a good time, a two-lane road coming out of California going into Nevada. It built up, I think it first changed when uh, Steve Wynn built the Mirage on the Strip. That kind of introduced the first new casino. We were off at that point. Uh, the casino industry built like it would never stop. And it never had stopped up at that point. We had always had constant growth. I mean, the hotels that have gone up, the Taj Mahals are incredible these days. I mean, 4,000 rooms, 3,000 rooms. Uh, it's just unbelievable. City center is a giant giant facility but it stopped it stopped with the recession and uh and it hasn't come back uh very difficult i'm not going to predict what's going to happen in the near future the far future but it uh it just isn't there anymore and, and, and that's good in the ways for people who want to come to las vegas because las vegas is an absolute bargain these days yeah. it so, is but it's it's uh, the good old days are gone and I'm not sure, some people might not think they were so good, but the people who were there, uh, the people who experienced it, like Joe and I and uh, so many others, I think most of us would say uh, they indeed were uh, the good old days, the good old days of that spectacle in the desert. Certainly they were colorful without a shadow of a doubt, and I don't think that uh, anything like it could ever be repeated no. anywhere. It was a unique business and in the unique part of the world at a particular point in history and it was uh, and we had a window we had a window uh, through which we could look at it and it was uh, one of the more exciting uh, periods in, in my life <laughs> uh, most of the incidents uh, if not every one of them that I'll recall uh, in this segment, uh, were when I lived in Los Angeles, uh, in the Hollywood area. Uh, and it probably manifested that, that part of my, uh, my personality, my character, whatever, that um, certainly people could criticize. There's, there's more than one thing individuals could criticize. You can criticize just about anything. You know, sometimes I wonder if some people have nothing more to do. Uh, you, you wonder if they have too much time on their hands. So I'm not going to worry too much about it. But fast and reckless certainly sums up one element of, of my life. Some of us just don't care that much. Uh, I recall motorcycle ra races, car races, boat races, um, brushes with the law, drugs, uh, a, a lot of uh, less than exemplary things. Uh, and looking back over these things, I, I have to question myself, too. Don't think I don't. I have to question myself repeatedly. Uh, and you know what, I've, what I constantly come up with is, I wonder if some of these negative things contain within them the seeds uh, to be able to do some of the positive things. Because I don't see a whole lot of people uh, that have had nothing but positive experiences being able to have done what I did for a long time. But some of the things I, I recall, some of the incidents, uh, uh, one was in Topanga Canyon, uh, which is uh, a canyon between uh, the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles and Malibu, which is where the Pacific Ocean is. Uh, uh, it's a typical California canyon road. Uh, it's a dangerous road, uh, cliffs, um, a lot of curves. Uh, you and you, you wouldn't want to drive fast on that road if you were a prudent person. Uh, of course, uh, I, I, in those days, could have never been accused uh, of being a prudent person, so I always drove fast on that road. As a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons that I took that road over to the beach. One day I was in the Ferrari, and two girls in a Shelby Mustang, which is a kind of a custom Mustang that it's handles better, it's faster, they pulled up behind the Ferrari, and I was going probably 70 or 80 miles an hour. And they wanted to pass me on that twisting canyon road. 
And uh, in the first place, it wasn't very uh, smart to try to do that, but that, that, that didn't concern me. I didn't care how stupid they were. Uh, but the fact that they wanted to pass me, I, 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 it was a kind of a challenge in my, uh, uh, my adolescent way of, of viewing things. So uh, it wasn't going to be happening that day, I thought. So we got up to 100, 110 miles an hour. And, uh, and, and I, I have to admit, um, I, I was uh, nervous and uh, I was questioning whether or not I was willing to die to win that race and apparently they were willing to more than I was because on a curve they passed me going about 110 and gave me the universal salute of human derision and, and I, I, uh, I had to uh, tuck my uh, tail between my legs so to speak and, and sulk off into my cave and try to recover from that for some time. That's one race I didn't win. Um, uh, there are a lot of races that I didn't win um, you know, uh, every time a baseball player comes up to bat, he doesn't hit a home run. Uh, every time a, a runner gets in a race, he doesn't necessarily win the race. The be some of the best boxers in history lost some of their fights, and, uh, and that wasn't necessarily what defined them. Uh, what defined them is whether or not they could get up uh, and go on. One time in Los Angeles, uh, my less than, uh, than stellar exploits, uh, I was on the way home from a nightclub with um, some uh, women friends who uh, happened to have the dubious profession of being uh, uh, strippers in a nightclub. They were in my Mercedes and I got stopped by the, uh, the local constabulary uh, who thought that uh, perhaps I was driving somewhat erratically. Uh, I probably was. Um, I, they checked me and I was right at the limit. And I think it was .08. And, and um, so it looked like I, I was going to take a trip to the local lockup uh, that Friday night. The, the, the only problem with that was uh, I had a um, bag full of cocaine in my pocket. They searched me, didn't find it, handcuffed me, put me in the back of the police car, and I can still remember vividly to this day, trying with my handcuffed hands behind me, trying to get the little bag of, of uh, what constituted my ticket to the big house out of my pocket, and I couldn't do it. So they uh, transferred me to the uh, city jail, uh, and they, with the stern warning, now look, you're, you're a good guy, and you didn't give us any trouble, but these guys aren't like this that take care of the jail. I think it was, might have been the sheriff's department or the, I'm not sure who it was, but it wasn't the city police. And, um, and so they said, yeah, they, they, they uh, don't have anything better to do, so don't even look at them. So that encouraged me. It, it was a mess of a night. The, they took the handcuffs off me and searched, my, searched me really well. They did their job. They weren't negligent. They really did their job. Matter of fact, the officer that searched me turned my pockets inside out. Amazingly, perhaps, I don't know, I don't like to use the word miraculously, loosely, but who knows? Um, it never came out. They never found anything. Put me in the holding tank with the uh, general run of, uh, uh, of drunks and brawlers on Friday night. And um, I spent the night there. Uh, dropped the little bag of evidence behind the bench and uh, no doubt some officer or janitor um, found it at some point and uh, either uh, scratched their head in wonder or had a, a heck of a party that weekend. Uh, one, uh, at one time one of my girlfriends was a drug dealer. They tried to, well they did rob her, beat her up, took her money and her drugs. We found out who it was and I hid in the closet with an Uzi machine gun with a 32 round magazine ready to rock and roll. I would have killed them all. God had other plans. Uh, might have killed them all. Uh, they luckily never showed up. Fast, reckless, stupid, all of the above, more than once. That reminds me of another Similar kind of a thing, only on a much grander scale. Luckily, I wasn't involved with this one directly, but 
my girlfriend came to our, my partner's home one day and, and told me that uh, our drug dealer uh, had, uh, had some people killed. And uh, the, uh, the bodyguard of the, this drug dealer, who was, by the way, the biggest drug dealer in Los Angeles, they went on to make a movie about this called, the, called Wonderland. Yeah, they were termed the Wonderland Murders, uh, also the Laurel Canyon Murders, I think. I knew about it shortly after it happened, but um, couldn't prove it. I, I uh, told my dad about it, who worked at the Los Angeles Times. We told the police about it. The police knew, but they couldn't get enough evidence. Um, and those uh, murders, I think there were four of them, brutal murders, uh, went unsolved for years. And in the end, um, I think he got off anyway. Eddie Nash was this drug dealer's name. Many uh, movie stars, professional athletes, well-known people would uh, get their cocaine from him or from the people that worked for him. And uh, it was a fast lane life. Uh, it was reckless and it was deadly. In that last year, I lived in Los Angeles, 12 people I knew died as a direct result of cocaine abuse. Uh, it's a horrible thing. To this day, I hate uh, drugs. Uh, it, it, uh, and only like somebody who knows it from the inside uh, possibly could. Um, it's a deadly thing. Um, same thing with alcoholism. Uh, you, you have to live in close proximity to someone suffering from that disease uh, in order to realize how potentially deadly uh, it, it can be. I, I certainly don't hate the people. Uh, we have to love them, but, but what afflicts them, the uh, addiction, is a terrible thing. And I saw it from the inside. I was involved with it. It almost killed me. And all I can do is keep praying. Now, I ask you right now to pray for them. Pray for them that somehow God in his mercy will release them from that bondage. It's slavery. Addiction is slavery. 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 Fruit, in its essence, is not a something. It is a somebody. His name is Jesus Christ. When truth is called a lie, the light go out. Darkness falls, and indeed, if your light is darkness, how very deep will the darkness be? All the words in this book can be compressed into one word, the eternal word, Jesus the Christ. Concerning the Eucharist, there were two documents uh, presented to the church in 1980. You I know, we all have, I hope, something that we can look back on and, and, uh, and think, you know, I'm glad I did that. And I have a few things like that. And you always hope that when you're on your deathbed, you, you can look back on your life and think, oh, thank God that I was able to do that because... Perhaps that will plead my cause uh, before the judgment seat of Almighty God. Uh, I think probably the greatest work I ever undertook in my time as a Catholic priest uh, concerned the catechism of the Catholic Church. Um, I knew that would be an enormously important thing from the very beginning. Um, providentially, fortuitously, I saw the first draft of the Catechism of the Catholic Church um, uh, at Cardinal O'Connor in New York. Uh, Cardinal O'Connor's director of religious education, Monsignor Michael Wren, well, I, we were on retreat at the same monastery and he gave me a copy of the first draft of the Catechism of the Catholic Church and a red pencil and he said, uh, now I know you're not a priest yet, but make Make notes and corrections. Where it's good, say so. Where you think it's weak, say so. I'd like your, your input. And that was my first contact with the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the very first draft. I was uh, able to see every succeeding draft because I was subsequently at the University of Navarre 
in Spain that had a, uh, a department, a major department uh, in catechetics, and the university received all the drafts. So I was able to see every succeeding draft. And when it was finally published um, in French and in Latin and in Spanish, uh, I worked with, with it mostly the, at the uh, Spanish version. And I began to teach and preach from it from the very beginning, even before it ever came out in English. Uh, I knew it was an incredibly important, valuable gift to the church. Uh, and so I used it. I mean, I took it very seriously. In 1996, Bishop William Wigan invited me to go to the Diocese of Sacramento, California to teach the catechism to his diocese. Um, he was a good bishop. He wanted the best for his people. Uh, that was one of the worst poundings I ever took in my life, one of the worst persecutions. I had death threats. Uh, we, we, formed a, we formulated a plan to teach the catechism where we would uh, uh, get a big venue to accommodate the people who would want to do it. I, I broke the entire catechism of the Catholic Church. I broke that down into basically 48 one-hour lectures. Uh, we had one Saturday a month for 12 months, four hours a day, lectures on the contents of the catechism, one hour each Saturday for question and answer. Uh, the result was uh, the series that I did, The Teaching of Jesus Christ, which ended up on EWTN television called Father Karapi and the Catechism. Uh, it, it was, it's a 50-part teaching on CD and DVD. I uh, was on television on Sunday night, prime time on EWTN, for over 15 years. Um, it helped a lot of people. Uh, I'm not saying that to toot my own horn. Uh, it's, it's a fact. I know that from the thousands and thousands and thousands of people that sent us letters, emails, telephone calls to tell us how that helped them, how that brought them to the faith, uh, how that enhanced their faith, how, the, how they perhaps for the first time ever understood their faith, grew in their faith. I had Buddhists, I had Hindus, uh, I had Muslims, I had Christians of every de denomination uh, listen to that, watch that on television, get the DVDs, the CDs, uh, and it enhanced their faith. And I'm so thankful uh, that I was able to do that, so thankful uh, to the wonderful EWTN network that they, that they were able to air it for so long. Uh, I think probably if I had to choose one thing, and I, I thank God I have a, a number of things that when I'm on my deathbed and we'll all be there at some point, that will comfort me. Uh, that I had done that and perhaps someone grew in their faith uh, because of that. That series is the only thing of its kind in the entire world in the Catholic Church, and that boggles my mind. I don't know why. I don't know why someone else, uh, certainly there are many people as qualified or more qualified than I am to have done that, but no one did anything that big. There were a few small ones, a few hours, but there was nothing in depth and, and breadth that uh, synthesized the Catechism of the Catholic Church, as Pope John Paul II, the author of the Catechism, the promulgator of the Catechism, said, it's a sure norm for teaching the faith. And I, I hope that despite all of my deficiencies and failings and, and, uh, and, and, fa and failures, uh, I, I really hope that that teaching on the Catechism that I was privileged to do uh, was a help for people. I helped to get them from here to there, <laughs> from this life to eternity. Dogs and the outdoors have always been a big part of my life. Uh, I started fishing when I was four years old and hunting when I was about 12. 
And since I've been able to, I've always had two or three hunting dogs. Uh, my oldest Chesapeake Bay Retriever, Sage, died this year, unfortunately, at the age of 10. And uh, Delta uh, is another Chesapeake Bay Retriever. She's 10 now. And uh, then there's Greta on this side. She's a German wire hair pointer, but I've had hunting dogs uh, as long as I've been able to, and they've uh, enhanced my life uh, in a very big way. Uh, dogs have taught me a lot. I haven't had a, a large number of dogs in my life because many years I, I wasn't able to have dogs. Uh, all the years that I was in uh, seminaries, universities, uh, first years that I was on the road, uh, preaching as a priest, I, I couldn't have dogs uh, during those years. But then when I could, I was happy to have them. Uh, you know, dogs have always taught me lessons. Uh, uh, there are a lot of people that have dogs, I know that. And uh, people certainly love their dogs, and I'm no exception. Um, they're a big part of my life, as I've said. Uh, uh, in recent years, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, I got my first dog in several years, and uh, that would, was Sage, uh, the Chesapeake Bay Retriever, uh, who passed away uh, uh, this past the end of October and uh, early November. Uh, Sage saved me. Uh, here at my home in Montana, uh, I was in the shower about 6 o'clock one morning, and uh, I heard a tremendous dog ruckus coming from uh, out around the kitchen and I figured the dogs had seen a bear out the window because uh, it was in September and the bears will be down out of the mountains uh, down here in the valley looking for uh, food before the winter and they get apples and whatever other fruit they can get or grain and fatten up for the winter. So I had seen that a black bear around the house and I figured he came around and the dogs saw him and were uh, sounding the alarm. So I got out of the shower, put on a pair of jeans, and I'm soaking wet, and I picked up a pistol uh, as an afterthought, just if I had to, to scare the bear away. I'd fire a shot into the ground, and the noise would scare the bear away. Well, much to my surprise, I came out into the uh, uh, my office area, which is next to the, the kitchen, and there, Sage uh, had a man pinned in the corner of the kitchen with his whole leg in his mouth. There was another per man kicking Sage, and the two other dogs, uh, the ones that are here with me now, Delta and Greta, went off after the second man. Well, it was quite a scene. Uh, me, half naked, dripping wet with a pistol in my hand. And so I held the, them for the sheriff to come. But it was quite a scene. But who knows what would have happened if Sage hadn't intervened and um, basically, as we say, neutralized the threat. Uh, he, other than that, they're just great companions, and I have to say, you know, if I'm telling you about me in this story, I have to say that, that my dogs uh, throughout the years have been a tremendous uh, blessing uh, for me. And the outdoors, uh, fishing and hunting, that, that's part of my heritage. I grew up in a small city in upstate New York, and uh, that's what we did. That's part of our, uh, of our heritage. I, remember uh, from 12 years of age hunting uh, rabbits and squirrels and uh, pheasants. Um, it was, I looked forward to it tremendously. It's uh, part of our American heritage. Sometimes people don't always understand that. Um, <laughs> there was a picture that showed up in the, on the internet of me with a, a, a large grizzly bear that I had um, shot after a really hard hunt in Alaska. and. Um, I, I was at, a, at an event after that, a conference with several thousand people, and during a question and answer period, uh, a woman said, I saw that picture of you and that poor fuzzy bear on the internet, and uh, I think it's just ho horrible. I'm a member of PETA, and we don't like that. Well, I responded that I also am a member of PETA, and she was quite taken ba back by that. And she said, you're a member of PETA? I said, yes, people eating tasty animals. Now, <laughs> the, the crowd roared. She didn't like it very much. And I assure you, I won't be invited to Peter's Christmas party this year. But that's part of who I am. I, I can't help it. I grew up that way. I, I'm a, a pro-hunting person. I'm a pro-gun person. And I think it's absolutely infantile 
and uh, lacking in a lot of wisdom uh, to think that Americans uh, should be denied their heritage uh, because of imagined threats. Listen, the, uh, the first homeland security uh, was armed citizens, and the Second Amendment isn't there to protect, protect duck hunters. It's there for personal defense and for good reason. In the journey of our life, we never quite know what's around the next corner. Uh, I had uh, something like that happen to me when I was 55 years old. I went in for a routine physical, and uh, at the, uh, upon the advice of a friend of mine, um, I had a um, uh, heart uh, test, uh, a uh, electrocardiogram, and um, I, the cardiologist said, well, that test isn't very reliable. Why don't you have this other test? And that led to another test, uh, heart catheterization. And uh, that began one of the more uh, uh, interesting, if not traumatic, events of, of my life. Um, I was in the cath lab at a particular hospital in Northern California, and uh, I had a heart catheterization, which is an invasive procedure, which basically uh, uh, they thread a, a catheter uh, through your groin, and it's got a camera basically, and they, they look at a picture of your coronary arteries, your heart. Uh, while I was still lying on the table in the cath lab, the doctor solemnly pronounced, I have bad news for you, I'm very sorry, but you need emergency heart surgery. Uh, that was uh, a startling pronouncement because I had no symptoms. I didn't know I was sick. I didn't feel sick. And he said, you need surgery immediately, tomorrow. I was in shock. It's hard to believe what uh, something like that can do to you, the effect that it can have on, on you. It's almost uh, it can produce a psychosomatic kind of a reaction. Uh, depression, uh, anxiety, and... Um, I went home and uh, a friend of mine called to ask how the results came out and we said, not so good. And uh, my friend Joe Zerga uh, and uh, uh, his longtime friend Christine Modi, uh, who's a registered nurse and at that time she was in uh, cardiac ICU at a major hospital in Las Vegas. And uh, she said, well, don't have the surgery there. Uh, come here to Las Vegas. I know all the best surgeons and cardiologists. Uh, you can uh, come and stay at our house after the surgery and I'll take care of you. And uh, that sounded like a good plan. So uh, we did that. I collected uh, my records from uh, the hospital in California, got on the first plane that I could to Las Vegas. But, uh, Christine had set up a, uh, an appointment with a good cardiologist. I had all my records, the uh, angiogram, um, uh, picked basically a movie of my heart and coronary arteries. And uh, early that morning, uh, we stopped at the parish church and I went to confession, um, <laughs> just to be sure. You never know, you know, when you're facing major surgery, uh, the first thing you want to be, uh, have in order is, uh, 
your relationship with God, and uh, I didn't have any major sins uh, to confess. Nonetheless, we're all sinners, and uh, I felt better having gone to confession, and I, then we proceeded to the cardiologist's office. He took the, uh, the disc, put it in his computer, studied the movie of my coronary arteries and heart, and uh, pronounced, uh, what are we bypassing? Uh, there's nothing here to bypass. No significant occlusions of the coronary arteries, and um, he said, well, I'll send you over to the surgeon anyway. So uh, he sent me over to the surgeon at another hospital. Uh, she came down, a good Irish girl, and uh, Nancy Donahoe, and she uh, took us to a viewing room, put the disc in a computer, and uh, proceeded to explain what we were looking at. And she said, oh, that's, uh, you have wonderful coronary arteries. Um, uh, you have coronary arteries like garden hoses, meaning <laughs> good flow and no problem. I said, why do I need um, emergency surgery? She said, you don't. I said, well, how on earth could another doctor tell me I need emergency heart surgery immediately that's a life-threatening situation. She just shook her head. And it's the first time I ever heard the term medical fraud. And, uh, well, that began an interesting three years. Uh, it's not like I had nothing to do. Uh, I was very, very much um, engaged and very busy with my ministry that time as a Catholic priest, traveling all over the country. Uh, I didn't need another project, and I didn't want to do it, but, uh, you know, the longer I, I went on, and I didn't have to go on too long, I knew what I had to do. Sometimes uh, you get a mission presented to you, uh, it's not one you like, it's not one you care to do, uh, and yet it's compelling. I remember sitting at dinner with my friends uh, that evening uh, in a restaurant in Las Vegas, and uh, it, it was very clear to me that my situation was either an aberration or part of a pattern. When I went home, I did a little research and found that that particular hospital had uh, a, a very low mortality rate. It had this major uh, uh, department doing uh, uh, cardiovascular surgery, uh, but their mortality rate was way better than even the best hospitals in the biggest cities. And that immediately told me one thing. They're probably operating on healthy people. It didn't tell me that they're, they're way better than the best hospitals in California, New York, Boston, and so forth. Now, that, that to me sent a signal they're operating on healthy people. That's what I believed then. That's what I still believe. And that began a a very unusual phase in my life. It consumed me almost day and night for three years. Myself and my uh, old friend Joe Zerga uh, knew there was something wrong, and we knew that we had to do what we could do uh, to try to um, uh, stop this, to try to make a difference. Uh, we were convinced that healthy people were having their chest cracked open for money. Uh, there was a joke in that particular town that if you if you if you got a flat tire in front of that hospital, you better watch out because you'll end up with a triple bypass. Uh, I, it wasn't quite that bad, but uh, uh, there's all kinds of wild stories uh, that came out of that. Um, three years of my life, day and night. Uh, why did I do it? Uh, well, my office manager at the time said to me, I didn't want to do it, but she said, look, if someone else were in this position, knowing what you knew, could they morally justify walking away or turning their back on this situation, knowing very well that innocent, healthy people are having their lives ruined because of a, what amounts to a racket? No one would believe us. We couldn't get a, a, a lawyer to represent us in this case because they, in the state of California at the time, they wouldn't do medical malpractice because the ceiling on awards was $200,000, which is not enough. 
uh, to justify the amount of work that has to, to go into these things. We realized, though, it wasn't just medical malpractice. It was fraud, Medicare fraud. Uh, and if we could get the FBI involved, we'd have a chance of stopping this. Well, it was never conclusively proven that there was criminal fraud involved, although, you know, I believe it, and many other people believe it. The FBI believed it. The U.S. attorney believed it. But the standard of proof uh, is very high for criminal fraud. Uh, and after three years of investigation, uh, exhaustive investigation, the FBI did a great job, and so did the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, they, had to set, set, they had to settle for taking it out of the financial hide of this particular uh, health care corporation. Uh, they law it was an international incident. They lost oh, over $50 billion, I think it was, in asset value, stock value, equity, which was a shame for the stockholders. It wasn't their fault. But the management is another story. Um, over 800 people received awards of a million dollars or more uh, because of the damages they had incurred uh, through what we believed then and still believe was unnecessary surgery. Uh, 60 Minutes did a story on it. Ed Bradley was the reporter. Um, it was called Unhealthy Diagnosis on uh, CBS 60 Minutes. They won an Emmy Award for that uh, broadcast. In the end, uh, we stopped it. The hospital had to be sold to another company. The uh, cardiologist, who was the, the point man in this whole program, he lost his medical license uh, because of my original complaint. And I, I have to say that a, a little house of horrors is what I believe that place to have been. Uh, they were stopped. And um, the medical profession was way better off, and so was the public. Um, I was almost run out of town, uh, and it wouldn't have been, it won't be the first and last time I was accused of doing it for money. Uh, the re we didn't even know about any money uh, at the time. We, we knew that something bad was going on, and it had to stop. And so we did what we could uh, as a public service. Filed, uh, federal and state actions called QUITOM actions, which are in the federal is an action under the Federal False Claims Act, Medicare fraud. And we recovered $54 million to the taxpayers of the United States because of Medicare fraud. Uh, the victims uh, received awards, as I said, um, averaging over a million dollars apiece. Myself and Joe, we, we got an award too as whistleblowers. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm always amazed how how, how uh, the critics, um, the, the harpies, especially on the internet, I call them cyber harpies, trolls they've been called, they have nothing better to do but to criticize others who get things done. They themselves have never done anything for the most part, but they make a living out of criticizing others. Uh, we're satisfied that what we did saved lives. What we did uh, made the medical profession better off because that was a blight on the medical profession that that could have existed. And so although uh, I got pounded and persecuted for it, uh, my conscience is clean that in that case we, uh, we did a very good thing by bringing a very bad thing to an end. Welcome to my chapel. I'm in my home and uh, it's a small chapel upstairs, and uh, you know, all of the things you see here were gifts to me. Uh, they were given to me over the years uh, by wonderful people. This crucifix, a Santini crucifix from Italy, was given to me uh, by a physician and his wife. Uh, there are so many things uh, over here. You see the, uh, the image of uh, the divine mercy, Jesus, I trust in you, uh, of course, that was, um, that was, that's always been a major devotion for me, very important. Uh, trust in the mercy of God, the uh, devotion certainly uh, uh, inspired by uh, St. Faustina. And um, 
a very interesting one made by uh, someone uh, that used to go to uh, some of my conferences, one of uh, the Blessed Mother, Our Lady of the Eucharist. This is handmade. It, it's uh, very beautiful. Uh, so many things. Each one of them represents uh, some place that I've been. Uh, one of the places, one of the more than 500 missions uh, that I did uh, in the course of 20 years uh, of, of preaching in the Catholic Church. Uh, they remind me of uh, the wonderful people uh, that I had the privilege of speaking to, and I haven't forgotten those people, and I know uh, some of them haven't forgotten me either. I don't take that for granted. You know, one of the things that throughout my life uh, maybe plagued me the most or hurt me the most, befuddled me the most, confounded me the most, um, was politics in the church. Now, wherever human beings are, uh, you're going to have failings, every one of us. We're all sinners, I am, every one of us is. Nonetheless, I suppose it's worse when we, we see it in places where we expect not to see it. Uh, when we see it in religious people, their failings, me included. Uh, when we see it in the church at large, uh, we see things that we, we don't expect to see them. The things that we see in the secular world, like in secular politics, where you have liberal and conservative, left and right. You don't expect to see that in the Catholic Church or any other church, but you do. Why? Because human beings are there. There's only one problem, and the problem isn't God. And the problem isn't the church, the problem is people. Individual human beings. That's always the problem. There's only one problem. People. Uh, we fall short in all kinds of ways, and I hate to say, but I encountered some vicious politics inside of the church. When I uh, taught my course on the Catechism of the Catholic Church, I encountered vicious opposition to that. Uh, the most unbelievable cutthroat kinds of things took place. Uh, you, you would probably not believe it if I told you some of those things. Uh, things like death threats, things like people calling the Chancery Office to register for the, the program on the Catechism and, and uh, personnel there would hang up on them lose their registration fees. Even pastors got in their pulpits on Sunday to say, don't go to this course on the catechism. We don't need that. It's not good. It was the bishop's course. I, I, didn't, ha I didn't do it. I, I was the instrument. The bishop wanted it. He wanted his people to have it. But because we were doing something strong and good, uh, it was opposed. One of my favorite passages from Scripture, and I've had to use it uh, frequently, is when Jesus said, you think I've come to bring peace? I've not come to bring peace, but division, a sword that will separate a household of five, three against two, and two against three, father against son, and son against father, and so forth. The sword is the truth. When the truth is set before people in a bold, clear, uncompromising manner, it will bring division. Now, ultimately, it will bring unity. Approximately, it brings division. If a whole bunch of people don't hate you and love you, you're probably doing something wrong. If everybody says, oh, Joe's a good old boy, and no one has anything bad to you, well, you're probably not doing a whole lot. If you have any kind of a responsibility, uh, to the public. Uh, politicians, you know, the, the, the business would be important. They want everybody to like them. That's not possible. Unity subsists in truth. There's no place for politics in churches. There's no place for that kind of divisiveness. Unity subsists in truth. If some people don't like the truth, tough. You have to present it in season and out of season, convenient or inconvenient, accept it or reject it. It doesn't matter. You have to present it boldly, 
confidently, without compromise. And if they don't like you for it, if they hate you for it, if they persecute you for it, if they curse you for it, as Jesus said, rejoice. Rejoice. You know, that, that's a sign you're doing the right thing. Now, don't get cursed for doing the wrong thing. But if you remain faithful to the truth, do your job, you'll, you'll be all right. You know, I, I mean, a few people here, there are a million people, might hate you for it. But that's an occupational hazard of, for doing what's right. Now, a lot of times, of course, you try to do what's right, but treachery will overtake you. Perhaps in the course of doing what's right because of human failings, which I have many, uh, you will make mistakes. You'll fall on your face. Uh, make no mistake, the predatory harpies will jump on you and try to rip you to pieces. They will try to finish you off. I learned that a lot of people are envious, jealous. A lot of people despise your success. A lot of people despise any, if you can call it in quotation marks, success that I ever had. Some of the closest people to me despised and envied what I was able to accomplish. Uh, some of the closest people to me betrayed me, stabbed me in the back, cut my throat, tried to finish me off, and it's not over. They will continue to try to finish me off. Uh, many of you know that uh, there some unfortunate things happened in the last months, the last year of my life. It's nothing new. Uh, I've had these things for a long time. This one was pretty definitive, though. The person closest to me that I literally picked up out of the street gave her back her dignity and self-respect, gave her a good job, gave her meaningful work, not to mention a good life for her and her husband, stabbed me in the back when she didn't get her way. And that's what it amounts to. Stabbed me in the back because she didn't get her way and in the current state of affairs in the church where there is really no due process. And if you are accused, you are probably condemned uh, this is, you, you just, you don't have the choices you think. You know, a lot of people think, well, he just walked out and he just quit. No, I was basically thrown out. I was basically given no choice. The choice I was given was no choice at all. For 20 years, I never received a reprimand. For 20 years, I never had a warning. For 20 years, I never had a single negative thing said to me by any superior ever in the history of the time I worked in the Catholic Church. And then a complaint came, and I, I don't know what, they, they won't say who the person complaining is, who the accuser is, they won't show you the evidence. There was no rebuttal, no time to present your side of it. Uh, my lawyers, canon and civil, said, there's no way you can win with this. There's no way you can get it. You're just dead meat. I think every one of us, when we come toward the end of our life, we reflect on uh, what's taken place. Uh, have we done any good? Have we made any difference? Was there more good than bad? Uh, even uh, I think the most insensitive of us uh, think about that sometimes. And I think the older you get, perhaps, uh, the more you think about those things. When you're young, it's, it's just not a blip on the radar screen. When you get older, uh, you begin to wonder, and, and I'm no different. Uh, I, I've had to look back on my life and reflect on whether or not uh, uh, I did that much uh, with it. Uh, all of us are given talents, as the Bible says, and uh, we're held accountable uh, for what we did with them. Certainly in my case, uh, there's been ups, there's been downs, there's been good, there's been bad, there's been ugly. Uh, and uh, all of the above, uh, maybe more than in the average life. Uh, my book, my autobiography, uh, will be uh, out pretty soon uh, as we're doing this. I'm nearing the completion of that. 
Um, we a lot of uh, symbolism in the title, the black sheepdog, that pseudonym that uh, I've uh, uh, adopted. Uh, crossing the Rubicon uh, will be the uh, the name of the book. There are other books with that title, but they don't have this this uh, content. So uh, certainly you can have uh, uh, a title, and there are no black sheepdogs crossing the Rubicon. I can assure you that. Let me tell you what uh, Wikipedia, the online encyclopedia, says. The Rubicon uh, is a shallow river in northeastern Italy, about 80 kilometers long. It runs from the Apennine Mountains to the Adriatic Sea to the su southern Emilia-Romagna region, between the towns of Rimini and Cesena. Well, it's, it, it's of historic significance because um, during the Roman Republic, the river Rubicon marked the boundary between the Roman province of Cisalpine, Gaul to the north, and Italy proper, uh, controlled the boundary between the Roman province. Uh, and and, and, and the, the bottom line is, if you crossed the Rubicon uh, and you were a, a general in the army, uh, uh, you, bro you broke the law. Th this, was, uh, this was not permitted. The idiom crossing the Rubicon uh, means to pass a point of no return. And it refers to Julius Caesar's army's crossing of the river in 49 BC. Uh, it was considered an act of insurrection. Crossing the Rubicon, is a, it indicates a definitive point. Uh, I think I probably crossed the Rubicon in a symbolic way four times in my life. Um, it, it, now, I, ne I never thought I'd have to cross any more Rubicons, to be honest with you, when, moving towards the end of my life. Uh, I thought that I, I pretty much uh, knew how it would play out. But just when we think we know something, uh, we find out we didn't know what we thought we knew. Uh, I'm not interested in any acts of insurrection. I'm not interested even in gaining a following. At this point in my life, I'm just going to uh, tell the story and let the chips fall where they may. But looking back on it, and in light of recent happenings, uh, all the uh, accusations against me, all the controversy, uh, you know, I have to question myself too. There have been a lot of things in my life that haven't been good, but a lot of the things are just amazing to me. They're totally unfounded. And, and I'm startled that um, people who should know better have paid so much attention to it. Uh, and you have to question yourself, well, maybe I deserve it. Uh, maybe I have done things that, uh, that would bring this down on me. But then you've got to ask yourself in the end, but did you do any good? Did you do any good? I think probably the biblical... Uh, maxim or the words, the truth spoken by Jesus Christ himself is what all of us will be judged on. Jesus says, by their fruits, you will know them. And every one of us, I think, will be held to that standard. By their fruits, you will know them. You look at the sum total of a life and you, you ask, did they do anything to help other people, to benefit humanity, to further the kingdom, spreading of the gospel. Uh, no man can judge that. Only God in the end will judge that. And every one of us will have to be held in the pure light of that scrutiny. By their fruits, you will know them. How have we lived? God is our origin and our objective. God is life itself. God's essence is to exist. To the degree we enter into God, we enter into life. To the degree we enter into God, we enter into love. To the degree we enter into God, we enter into the purpose of our existence. God is our origin and God is our objective. But if you're not sure what your life is about, you don't know where you came from, you don't know where you're going. You don't know where you are right now. Look at a crucifix. 
In Christ, you are called to the same mission. Mission of the Redeemer. Life comes through Christ alone. No other way. Jesus Christ is the only way. He is the door through which we walk into the Father's presence. In a letter written by Reverend Michael Sullivan, who represents Father John Carapi, to the accuser's attorney, we find the following excerpt. It is fundamental to any civilized and fair legal process that, one, the accused is presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, two, the accused be provided the name of the accuser in the exact allegations that the accuser has made, three, the accused be given the right to present a defense, including the right to present evidence and testimony, review all the evidence and testimony made against him, and be given the opportunity to question the accuser and any witnesses presented by the accuser. Four, that the accused is entitled to an impartial fact finder. And five, the accused has the right to appeal any decision of the fact finder to a higher authority. There's no way you can win with this. There's no way you can get him. You're just dead meat. Sullivan then continues with 10 questions. One, the identity of any and all persons who have accused Father Karapi of actions deemed misconduct. Two, a copy of any and all allegations made against Father Karapi by any and all persons accusing him of such misconduct. Three, a copy of the Salt Constitution and the policies for ethics and integrity in ministry. Four, documentation explaining how the members of the commission were chosen. Five, Information and documentation showing the Commission's members, qualifications, and training for conducting the investigation of Father Karapi. 6. Documentation setting forth the rules, methods, procedures, and standards the Commission will use in conducting the investigation, evaluating the evidence, and arriving at its conclusion following the investigation. 7. Whether Father Karapi is presumed innocent by the Commission until he is proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. If not, please identify and document the standard of proof that the Commission will use in determining the validity of the allegations against Father Karapi. 8. Will Father Karapi have the opportunity to review and obtain copies of any and all evidence gathered by the Commission? If so, when? 9. Will Father Karapi be provided the names of all parties identified by the accuser as witnesses? How will Father Karapi's right to question each of these witnesses and accuser be upheld? And 10. Does Father Karapi have the right to appeal any decision of the Commission? If so, to whom? And so 20 years of labor, million plus miles of traveling, working until I could hardly keep my eyes open, arguably the most effective teaching tool in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, all trashed because of circumstantial, unsubstantiated allegations that I couldn't do a thing with. Uh, you don't, you reach a certain point where you don't know what to say. It's a sad, sad thing. Don't think for a moment that I like it. Don't think for a moment that I, I, I'm convinced that uh, my life is so great now that I don't miss a lot of things. There's no going back. I'm, I've crossed the Rubicon. You can look that up, see what Caesar did when he had to cross the Rubicon. No turning back once you cross the Rubicon. 
Many people have, have asked, well, is he still Catholic? Yes, I am. I believe everything the Catholic Church teaches in faith and morals. I was put in a very, very bad position. The choice I was given was no choice at all. And so, you know, it was made to look, well, he quit. He walked out. He resigned. Yeah, I did. Because I had no other viable choice. Well, I could have gone and effectively been put in prison, silenced for the rest of my life, and maybe that would have been the best thing to do, to just accept that. But <clears throat> everybody has to live with their decisions. Everybody have to ask, you have to make a decision, right or wrong, could be wrong, you have to make a decision based on what's in front of you, based on the emotional and um, intellectual, physical limitations that you have. You make a decision, right or wrong, and then you just have to follow through and do the best you can do. That's all any of us can do. Uh, some of us have fatal illnesses. Some of us are in prison. Some of us have lost loved ones. Some of us are marginalized. Some of us are poor. We have all kinds of deficiencies. We have all kinds of reasons to complain, to be cynical and bitter. We have all kinds of reasons to quit. We have all kinds of reasons to lay down and die. So long as there's breath, there's hope. So long as we have a breath left in this body, there is hope and there is potential to do something good, to do something good for humanity. If you help one human being, one word, a kind word here or there can change a life. So long as there's breath. So long as there's a single breath left, there's potential and there's hope. So I've chosen to go that way, to try to do what I can do. I don't argue with those who criticize that. I don't condemn them for criticizing me. We all go with what we think is right. And I've had to do that in my own case. If I can leave you with one thought, remember this, hope. Always hope and trust. In the end, you have to trust in God. Trust in the Lord. Hope in the Lord. And you will never hope in vain. God bless you.